Good afternoon and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Webinar Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Scott Marks and I'm a Program Manager for the Recycling Market Center. I will serve as the moderator today. Before we get started with the presentation, we would like to extend a special thanks to Bob Hollis of the Mobius Network for providing the webinar management software for this series and Savannah Petkowski of the National Recycling Coalition for assisting the RMC with webinar promotion and technical support. Today's webinar will discuss New York City's Zero Waste Initiative. Our presenter today is Bridget Anderson, who I will introduce in a moment. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question or comment, please use the GoToWebinar dialog box located in the corner control panel on your screen. You may also use the dialog box to request assistance if you are experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar. Please note that an edited version of this webinar will be made available for viewing via YouTube on the National Recycling Coalition and Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center websites. The presentation slides can also be obtained using the handout upload feature on your webinar control panel. And now I would like to introduce our presenter. Bridget Anderson is Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability for the New York City Department of Sanitation. She is responsible for the development and implementation of the DSNY sustainability initiatives with particular focus on waste reduction, composting, and recycling programs. Ms. Anderson also oversees future expansion of the organics collection program. She began her career with the Bureau of Waste Prevention, Reuse, and Recycling in 2007 and led a residential organics collection pilot, successfully expanding the program to 130,000 households in all five boroughs. Ms. Anderson serves on several national and regional committees on recycling, composting, and sustainable materials management, including the Recycling Partnership Technical Council, Association of Post-Consumer Plastics Recyclers, the U.S. Composting Council, ASTM International, among others. She received a BA in Geology and Biology from McAllister College and a Master of Public Administration in Sustainable Development and Policy Analysis from, from Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. And now I'm going to turn the program over to Bridget. So why zero waste? Zero waste, you know, is this um, aspiration. It's this um, goal to reduce um, the wasting of valuable products. And of course, the big challenge is always the logistics, the transportation, and the cost to actually capture valuable materials out of what people throw away. But ultimately, that can lead to more resiliency, more sustainability, um, and better quality of life in urban areas. And so in New York City, every week, the, the average New Yorker throws away about 15 pounds of garbage at home and about another nine pounds of waste at work and in commercial establishments. This is a lot of material. We have over eight and a half million residents in New York and we anticipate that number growing over the next decade or two. Um, so we, I have one coworker who loves uh, analogies. So this is the equivalent of 80,000 um, large beluga whales. <clears throat> so about the Department of Sanitation. So we are the largest, most complex waste management agency in the country, if not the world. Um, our goal, our mission is to keep New York City healthy, safe and clean. So we do collection of all of the materials that are set out curbside, whether that's refuse, recycling, and now organics. Um, and we also clean the streets. So we do street sweeping, we do vacant lot cleaning, and we also clear snow and ice. So we operate both as a snow operation and as a collection operation. We actually use the same trucks, the same rear loader trucks that we collect our waste and recycling with. We use to, um, we put plows on them and we use them to plow the snow. Uh, we serve not only our 8.5 million residents, but we have millions of commuters and tourists coming in and out of the city every day. Um, as I mentioned, we have um, a lot of material that we collect each day. We have over uh, 2000 collection trucks we have a network of transfer stations, um, some of them that we own and manage, and some of them that are privately operated. And we, while we don't collect from businesses, 
we do regulate them. So we regulate what businesses are required to recycle, which businesses are required to separate the organic material, which is a very new thing for us. Um, and we partner with the Business Integrity Commission who regulates the, the private hauling industry. So there's private haulers who um, circulate through the city. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of a modified free market system at present um, to collect all of the commercial waste in the city. <clears throat> For those of you who are not um, familiar with New York City, uh, it is an incredibly diverse place in terms of infrastructure. And so this is, these are some examples of the housing, uh, the differences in housing infrastructure in the city, depending on where you are. So if you're in Staten Island, there's five boroughs in New York City. Staten Island is one borough. Staten Island is fairly low dense. So it looks more similar to other cities um, that you see around the country. Single family, this is the upper right hand corner picture, Sing single family homes yards, um, maybe driveways. Um, and then to contrast with that, on the upper left-hand side, you have the high density areas of the city with high rises. You have complexes that have, you know, a thousand units in one building. We have a, a complex called Stuyvesant Town. There's 27,000 residents in that one complex of 110 buildings. So it's incredibly dense um, and uh, both in terms of people, in terms of infrastructure, and space limitations are a big, big issue for how we figure out how to logistically manage our waste, our, the flows of materials. And then the, on the bottom, you have something kind of in the middle. We have brownstones, we have townhomes, attached houses. Maybe there's multiple families living in these buildings or not. They're fairly, they're sort of medium density. And then one of the most challenging areas that we have for managing waste is the lower right-hand side, which is what we call mixed-use buildings. So you've got the mom and pop shops um, on the first floor, and above that you have residential um, apartments. There's very little space to manage the material. There's often confusion about what's commercial material in terms of waste and what's residential, where should it be set out, who picks it up. There's a lot of uh, litter challenges when you have material set out at the curb for collection. It becomes a, a target you know, for litter and other dumping. So we have, we have a very a uh, day by day logistical dance that we have to do to keep the streets clean, to keep our material flowing um, from homes out the city. And we have a long history of, of, you know, sort of tackling waste and having challenges for how to do that. Um, it is true, a very, very, very long time ago, we would actually bring waste out, this is, you know, 1800s, we'd bring uh, waste out by barge into the ocean and we would literally dump it. That was changed uh, at the turn of the century. And we, we modernized our system of managing waste. But there was, for a large portion of the 20th century, we um, operated a series of incinerators in New York City, throughout the city. Um, and that was seen as, a, as an efficient way to manage waste. There were consequent um, sort of, you know, pollution and public health challenges and uh, to run these facilities. And so the policy change was made to, to uh, get out of the incinerator business um, and open a very, very large uh, landfill. We had several landfills in the city over the century, the largest of which was the Fresh Kills Landfill on Staten Island, um, the, largest brand, uh, the largest landfill in the world. And it would take all of New York City's uh, trash every single day. Um, we then decided that um, this was not, uh, we did not uh, want to maintain um, operating this landfill. And so we, we made a move to, to change our strategy. And so the, a long, uh, sort of long political process was put in place and to, um, to close Fresh Coast Landfill, which meant that then we were in the business of exporting our material to other places, other locations, whether in the region or farther afield. These are just some examples of pictures um, at Fresh Coast. These are barges arriving with uh, waste material from different parts of the city at, at Fresh Kills. We then, in 2001, um, completed the closure of, um, of the operation of Fresh Kills. We are still today, that was 2001, we are still today working on the actual closure and conversion of that location into a park. It's a very, very long process to do that. Um, but we did have to temporarily reopen operations after um, September 11th and um, Fresh Kills was a location where the debris was taken and it became a, a, an investigation site as they were searching through debris for evidence and remains. 
Um, so today, where are we today? We have one of the most complex waste management systems in the world. We have um, multiple, it's a network of private transfer stations that are sort of the consolidation locations for our trucks that collect, um, you know, block by block. They consolidate their material at transfer stations. And then we export that waste outside of the city. Um, some, of, some of the locations where we export our waste is as much as 650 miles away. So ultimately, this is not the most sustainable um, method to manage waste, we think, and we'd like to um, keep material that's useful and can be resourced closer to home, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and also um, find more sustainable ways to transport that material. If we're gonna have to deliver it you know, farther afield, how can we do that more sustainably um, by uh, rail traffic specifically? So as I said, waste is a resource. We all know this. Um, recycling in New York City has been a mandate since 1989. And uh, residences have been required to recycle paper, cardboard, um, metal, glass, and plastic in two streams um, since 1989. And we, we are able to know, we know and uh, have been able to sell this material um, to be repurposed into new manufacturing um, successfully for over 25 years. Um, one of our sort of happy stories is that we have a, uh, paper, one of our paper recycling facilities is on Staten Island and they not only are the, they not only receive our paper and they receive it by barge, um, they also are manufacturers, so they create products. So we have um, cardboard and um, paper products that are manufactured in Staten Island um, from New York City paper. So it's a nice sort of circular local story for how we can um, successfully manage um, waste materials. Um, we have had also a long history of policy development around waste management. Um, the, starting with Mayor Bloomberg um, and continuing with uh, Mayor de Blasio, there, there was a real focus on how to create a more resilient uh, city given um, the challenges of being a coastal city, given the challenges of anticipated population growth and, um, and uh, managing um, sort of growing infrastructure. Uh, so, so we've had a series of, of sustainability plans. Some are related to infrastructure, some are related to energy. And um, the most current plan is called One New York, and it's uh, focused on su resiliency, sustainability, and equity. <clears throat> so we are uh, we're building a resilient, sustainable waste management system with an eye towards our sustainability goals. One New York, um, let me go back here. So One New York on the right-hand side um, is, is the document that stated our goal to send zero waste to landfills by 2030 um, and to reduce commercial waste uh, disposed uh, by 90% by 2030. Uh, that being, while we have these ambitious goals, we are still operating in a, um, an environment where we have a solid waste management plan that was generated in 2006 that we still ha are executing on. So we, part of our uh, solid waste management plan um, developed in 2006 was to have equitable management of our waste materials. So refuse had historically been um, routed into uh, only a few neighborhoods in the city that had had disproportionate impacts to having to manage waste. So one of the goals of the 2006 Solid Waste Management Plan was to generate um, transfer stations in every borough so that every borough would manage its own waste, so to, to gain some equity. So this is a picture of one of our marine transfer stations um, that's newly operating. And so when you're involved in generating, um, building infrastructure, siting, permitting, construction, operation, it takes a long time. So we are 11 years out and we're still in the process of finishing the building of this infrastructure from 2006. So here's a map of uh, where we stand with the development of this equitable infrastructure. Um, this is a map of New York City. Um, there's the five boroughs. So you've got, I don't know if you can see it if I point to these. You have, we have um, <clears throat> transfers, marine transfer stations that are being built or are operational in each of our boroughs. Um, we also uh, have uh, transfer stations that operate using, um, using, rail, um, using rail. 
And so the idea is we can either use barges to transfer material or use rail to transfer material and thereby reduce the number of long haul trucks that are having to go through the city to leave the city um, to deliver material to its destination. So how do we, <clears throat> so we have this infrastructure that we're building, it's in place um, and we're trying to grow. How do we now shift ourselves so that we're actually reducing the amount of material we have to send 650 miles away, that we're reducing the amount of material that is um, going towards disposal? This is not an easy question. City, there are cities all over the country that are trying to tackle a zero waste plan to figure out how we're gonna do this. And it's really, what we're learning is it's all hands on deck. There's not, it's not just one agency that's gonna solve this problem. It's a, um, it's a really a step-by-step -step approach. We have several avenues that we're pursuing um, and I'll walk through some of those avenues and I'm happy to um, you know, delve deeper into certain topic areas if that's of interest um, to, the, to the folks on the webinar. So the first things first, um, to determine how to um, divert our materials away from landfill, we have to, we have to know what's in, the, what's in the trash so we can figure out what, what to do with it. And what we've learned, and you can see here, this is our 2013 waste characterization study, uh, is that about a third of our waste stream, this is the residential waste stream, is uh, recyclables that are already mandated to be recycled. Um, so that's your clean paper and your cardboard, your rigid plastics, metal, glass, uh, plastic, and cartons. Then another third of our waste stream is organics that are suitable for composting or anaerobic digestion. And that's food scraps, 18%, food cell paper, and yard waste. So there, right there, we have two thirds of the waste stream that we know one third, we already have infrastructure developed. We already have trucks collecting recycling. We already have recycling um, materials, uh, materials recovery facilities to, uh, um, to take and sort that material and market it. And then for the organic side, for many, many years, for multiple decades, we have had a, a robust sort of community composting effort, but it only really diverts a small amount of food scraps. So now we're in the process of developing a parallel uh, diversion program like our recycling program for organics, and I'll get a little bit more into that. Then, okay, what about the other third of, of the waste stream? About 10% of it are materials where we have identified options and outlets for how to handle this material. We need to grow those programs, but we, we have a handle on, um, on, on sort of concepts and, and ideas and programs that we can grow. Um, and that's the purple layer. So that's harmful to products, e-waste. Um, 6% of our waste stream, surprisingly, is textiles suitable potentially um, for donation or salvage. And so we're trying to determine, we're trying to grow programs to, um, to improve the ability to, do, to, um, to retrieve donatable um, goods, such as textiles, um, for charitable use. This 26%, the gray area, other diapers, broken upholstered furniture, construction and demolition, we don't necessarily have strong answers for those pieces yet, um, but it's something that we're working on. So what we're trying to do now is grow the areas that we have, um, that we know, and also keep watching, keep watching the research happening, keep watching the innovation that's happening to figure out what to do with the other 26%. So starting with the recyclables, um, we, what we know is that um, we only capture about half of the recyclables that uh, New Yorkers throw away. So New Yorkers are still throwing away 20, 20, more than 25 years after the recycling program has become mandatory. New Yorkers are still throwing away more than half of what should be going into the recycling trucks. So our first step is how do we capture that material that we already have the infrastructure for, we already have the trucks to collect. Um, how do we handle that? Organics, we're just getting started. So you can see on the right-hand side here, um, we, we have a long way to go to capture all of our organics. And then with textiles, e-waste, um, and other donatable, durable goods, um, we're capturing some of it, which we feel pretty good about. Um, but there is still quite a bit of material that is, is getting discarded. And so we're trying to figure out how to grow the, those programs that we have. So we'll talk about that a little bit more too. So our recycling program in New York City has historically been a dual stream program. 
We keep our paper and cardboard separate from our metal, glass, and plastic. Um, and we have two uh, recycling, um, two primary recycling contracts. So the Sims Municipal Recycling, so the two pictures on the left-hand side are of um, Sims's uh, South Brooklyn Marine Terminal um, Materials Recovery Facility. So it's in Sunset Park, Sunset Park, Brooklyn. And it is one of the most um, robust and complex materials recovery facilities in the country, taking material directly from a municipality. There's over 20 optical sorters. Um, they are able to do an incredible job of sorting material into um, marketable commodities um, for sale on the recycling market. We all know that there's some challenges right now um, with recycling markets, but um, SIMS has the ability um, to, to really maximize um, getting value um, from the material that, that's being collected. This is just one of their facilities. They have another materials recovery facility in Jersey City, um, just outside of New York City. And they also have several um, sort of transfer station areas where they consolidate material in other boroughs and then take it by barge down to this um, facility. So we're trying to, again, minimize truck traffic where we can, leverage our waterways and leverage our rail. On the right-hand side, you can see a picture here of an example of a, a barge delivering recyclables. Um, and Pratt Industries, the, the um, company I spoke about on Staten Island, as I mentioned, they're not just a recovery facility, but they also generate products. They generate cardboard boxes. They generate paper that they both use themselves to create products and sell to other companies um, to, to manufacture products. One of the things we're, we are uh, looking at intensively is moving to single stream recycling. How do we capture that 50% of recyclables that are still getting thrown away? One strategy is to, um, to move to single stream recycling. Um, single stream recycling has um, operational efficiencies. So where you have two different trucks collecting those materials in a neighborhood, you can consolidate into one truck. We, we already use a lot of dual bin trucks, so trucks with two compartments where we collect both recyclables, but you can't be as efficient with a dual bin truck as you can with a single hopper truck because um, one side might load out before the other and so you're not able to fully maximize those trucks. So there are some operational efficiencies we think we can gain from single stream recycling. The biggest thing is that we are trying to add the organics program in New York City, which means we're adding another bin to people's waste stations. And by, and as you saw in the, in the photos, we are an incredibly densely packed city. And so finding ways to save space in internal building infrastructure, we see as a critical piece of trying to um, successfully um, make organics collection a, normal, a normalized activity and to also um, maximize our ability to, to collect recyclables. So we're trying to get, eventually get to a three bin system whereby the recycling is, is in one bin and um, organics is in a bin and then you have your trash bin which is hopefully smaller and smaller over time. <clears throat> so space constraints are a big, are a big um, reason to uh, move towards single stream. We obviously have to work through the um, contractual changes and the infrastructure changes that might be needed to actually adequately um, process single stream material once it gets collected. So we're in the process right, right now of having conversations with our recyclers to determine the best path forward to, um, to do the infrastructure development needed to switch to single stream. There are obvious um, challenges that we've heard, you know, throughout the country of, um, you know, we are, New York City is the only city, only big city in, in the country that has not gone single stream yet, that we're still dual stream. And we have been, you know, consulting with other cities about what are the challenges, you know, what are the downsides of single stream and obviously, being able to market the material and, and create value from the material is something that we're very um, cognizant of. And, um, and we think that we're able, we will be able to create a single stream recycling system that both could successfully help us save space within our uh, city's infrastructure and also create value on the commodity market. Another piece of where that 50% is going, so why are we still throwing away 50% is, um, is public housing. So, we have about 500,000 people in New York City live in public housing. So that's like the city of Atlanta. I mean, that's a huge amount of people 
um, that are living in public subsidized housing. And the, the these developments were built at a time when uh, recycling was not the norm, it was not an expectation. And so there is very little space to set up the recycling infrastructure and build in, in these public housing buildings. So we have been working with the New York City Housing Authority to try to determine, to try to find a path to, um, to provide access to recycling for public housing residents. So basically 500,000 people throwing away material every day, we anticipate that a third of that is recyclables, none of that's getting recycled. So how do we, how do we capture that material? So we're working very hard. The New York City Housing Authority has a 10-year um, sort of sustainability plan. And at the end of this year, they are going to be releasing their solid waste uh, management uh, plans for the next 10 years. And, um, and we are right there with them trying to help them figure out how to tackle um, this infrastructure issue of, of providing an opportunity to separate and recycle your material at NYCHA. So this is another area where we're really putting a lot of attention and focus of how do we how do we educate residents of what to do, make it convenient and easy, because you know if it's not convenient, participation will drop off. So the other, the second part of the pie uh, that we could discuss is um, organic suitable for composting. And we have, um, as part of our One, one New York um, plan, we have committed to expanding collection of organic material citywide, eight and a half million people, by the end of 2018. So we are about a year and a half away from that and um, we are uh, we're pretty far along. We're, we're doing it. We're doing a pretty good job of getting there. Um, so this is uh, the decal that goes in our brown organic spins. Uh, we collect food scraps, the yard waste and food cell paper commingled. Um, that has some uh, implications for the, the appropriate processing that we have to do. Um, we include all food scraps. So it prepared foods, meat, bones, everything. Um, obviously, we don't want any trash in, in there, and we don't want plastic bags. Plastic bags, however, what we are learning, we started a pilot to do food scrap uh, uh, separation in 2013, um, 3,500 homes, a tiny, tiny pilot on Staten Island. Um, and from that point forward, um, as we've been expanding the program into all five boroughs, um, we've learned that people really like to bag their material. To get broad participation in a program, they want, we have to find a way to accept the behavior that people are going to have to, um, to get them to participate. Um, so what we would prefer is that people use compostable bags, paper bags, et cetera, for the program. But what we're finding is, is the most convenient um, tool and bag for people to use are the free shopping bags that they get at stores. So this is something that we're contending with and I'll show some pictures more about that later. But we are committed to expanding NYC Organic Citywide by 2018. This is a map that shows um, where we have the program today and where we're expanding it. Um, we have sort of a two-pronged approach. So the yellow, hopefully the colors are coming through okay, but the pale yellow and the bright orange uh, the pale yellow are areas of the city that currently have the program. They currently receive curbside organics collection. Then you have sort of the, the medium yellow, which is Manhattan and a bit large portion of the Bronx. This is the densest part of the city, high rises um, and, and densely packed communities. And we've chosen an approach uh, of an enrollment program for that area of the city. So we're trying to enroll buildings um, into the program and give them a little extra support. Reason being, when you're adding a new waste management program into a building, you have to create your own, every building is its own mini city. So you have to create an internal strategy to manage the material in the building. We wanna make sure that the building supers, the building management companies are on board, they understand what to do, and then we roll out the program there. We also, the, the green dots are all of our drop-off sites. So while we are in the process of enrolling buildings in the program, we are offering, um, we are growing our food scrap drop-off program so that more and more New Yorkers have the opportunity if their building is not yet enrolled in the program to still drop off their food scraps. So we have about 90 food scrap drop-offs. We're growing that to over 100 in about a month. And we are still um, looking to expand food scrap drop-off opportunities 
so that all New Yorkers have the chance to get started separating their food scraps, get into the habit in a convenient way. Then uh, the bright orange areas are um, where we're expanding in 2017. So we're in the second month of our 2017 expansion plan. And um, the brown areas are where we will be expanding curbside service in 2018. So we have a plan. We have a, a set number of districts. These are all community districts. We're going community district by community district um, to expand this program. So as I said, our current, our current program, organics program focus, obviously, first and foremost, donating prepared food and canned goods. We want to make sure that we can avoid um, trashing anything that could have a useful life that could feed people, feed animals. Uh, so we're working to um, help uh, increase uh, the capacity, the, the transportation logistics capacity of um, food service, food rescue organizations in the city to take in more, more goods. We know we have a council member who tells us the story that in his district, there is a shelter. There's a line around the block every day um, waiting to be fed and they always run out of food. And we know that that's unacceptable because there should be, there is food out there that is edible. So how do we, the transportation logistics are the hardest part of how do we make sure that we can move um, you know, edible food um, to beneficial use. Then we, um, on the lower left, we, we do promote and we have promoted for, for a long time, uh, composting at home and composting in your community gardens. And so we still offer a support system. We have the New York City Compost Project that supports community composting as a way to generate your own compost that you can use on your own gardens as a way to, um, we do this in schools as a way to educate kids. We use, um, we do science and math learning um, with composting. Then we have the drop-off program. So we have drop-off sites, as I said, around the city where you can drop off your fruit and vegetable scraps. And then the big kahuna is the curbside program. So we've been rolling out these brown bins um, district by district to uh, try to uh, collect organic material from residents. And this is currently a voluntary program. You will not get a ticket if you don't participate. Uh, but what we're seeing is that it's an impressive number of, of New Yorkers are participating voluntarily right off the bat from the beginning. Um, and then some of them you have to, you know, kind of convince them and motivate them to try it, to give it a try to participate. Often what happens is that uh, they'll start by putting in their yard waste. Uh, and then we say, okay, now try putting in your food waste too and, um, and see how it goes. The, the grassroots community, as I said, of, of uh, compost groups has been an incredible benefit for us because they have been our advocates. They have been our... Um, our army of people out there advocating for the benefits of compost. We are also doing street tree care events where we're taking New York City generated compost and we're putting, using it on street trees. We're using it on medians where we can show the public, this is a, by giving us your food scraps, you're getting an immediate benefit back um, to your community. The brown bin is also a benefit for rodent reduction. So when we set out material, I, you know, unfortunately I didn't, put in here a picture of the piles of bags on the curb, black bags on the curb uh, on collection day. But uh, the typical standard practice is, you know, putting your bag material at the curb for collection. When you can contain that, that food waste in a bin with a latching lid instead of in a bag at the curb, you make it harder for rodents and other pests to access that food. And you also um, reduce bag breakage and leakage on, on the sidewalks, which helps to create a cleaner neighborhood, and also it's, it's less um, work for the superintendents or the business owners on those blocks. So where do we take the material? <clears throat> this is a map of um, our, our efforts to understand where in the region, so this is a map of the Northeast US, where in the reason, region are there permitted operating facilities that handle organics material? Um, and you can see there's a lot. So there's 50, the 50 mile radius, 100 miles and 300 miles. The rub is that many of these um, do not accept food waste. So you can see the brown, uh, the brown dots are all uh, composting facilities that do not accept food waste. Um, then the orange facilities are areas that do accept food, based, food waste, but they may have big restrictions on contamination, and on other um, caveats for what kind of food waste they, they might take. 
Um, and then the blue areas are some proposed facilities. Um, and what we're seeing, and this is actually a few years old, this map, but what we're seeing is that there are more facilities requesting to get permitted and to get financed. And so we're seeing a growth. And we also are seeing some of the existing facilities requesting to change their permitting so that they can handle more material. And that's not necessarily specific for New York City, but there clearly is an effort and a, and a movement to expand the capacity to manage more organic material, including food waste, um, in the Northeast region. So where do we take our material? So contamination was an early challenge for us. So early days, this is what the material looked like. This is actually coming from some of the schools doing organic organics. So we literally had people eight hours a day debagging this material. That is not a sustainable program. Um, and we had a you know quick learning curve of what to do. If you see the lower right-hand corner, there's actually uh, really good food in there. It's just bags, you know, so dealing with bags, both on the institutional side with schools and on the residential side with the shopping bags, we knew it was something we were gonna have to tackle. So when, when thinking about and planning the program, you know, source separation at home is still the, the, the top focus. How do we get people to separate their material currently into four bins, trash, paper recycling, MGP, and organics, and, and eventually hopefully three bins. And this happens not only in your apartment, your home, but if you're in a building, uh, um, the building operation has to keep them, maintain that separation of material until it gets out to the curb. Then um, our trucks collect material, and they, as I said before, they consolidate it at transfer stations. And, uh, and then eventually that material gets delivered to an end, an end facility. Um, because the end facilities that I showed you in that map had low tolerance for contamination, we realized we had to do something in the middle, in the, in the intermediate area, to try to debag and decontaminate and get rid of some of the contamination before we delivered it to the facilities. Because once we had cleaner material, more options uh, opened up for where we could deliver this material and have it be composted or digested. So our phase two of our current, uh, organics processing contracts requires that the vendor um, have mechanical decontamination uh, process, you know, equipment, pre-processing assisting equipment at the transfer stations. And this is a map, again, of New York City and where the vendors are located that are installing this equipment. So we have, um, what it is not shown on here is that sanitation actually runs and manages its own compost site on Staten Island. Um, and so there's also, there should be one there as well. And um, here's a photo uh, at, on Staten Island at our compost facility of the tiger, which is one piece of equipment that we are testing um, to decontaminate and debag the material that's coming in. Um, this equipment, um, the um, turbo separator, the different types of equipment that are being used are um, were not necessarily originally intended to handle municipal commingled loads of organic material. Um, so we're having a learning curve. You know, we're learning. You know what what uh, causes the equipment to clog? Are there issues with um, how much, you know, water might have to be added to the system to get proper separation of the contaminants with the food waste? But what you end up having is uh, one shoot comes the bags, the contaminants, um, any, you know, chip bags or anything. And out the other side comes the organic material. It's not a perfect separation, but it's a vast improvement and it allows us to then take that organic material and find outlets for it. So an example of outlets, we've got, um, we've got McEnroe Farms um, upstate in New York and they are, they are um, a wonderful partner of ours. They do have low tolerance for contamination and so we will need to, um, you know, to be a good partner for them, we are trying to send them as clean of material as possible. Um, uh, and uh, another experiment that we're doing, which I'm very excited about, is, um, is co-digestion within New York City at our wastewater treatment plants. So this is a picture of Newtown Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant. It's uh, run by the Department of Environmental Protection. They have excess capacity in their digester eggs. And so um, they are running a demonstration, a three-year demonstration project um, with waste management to generate a bio slurry of, from the food waste um, and then feed that into the digester eggs to help um, maximize the energy that's generated at, at the facility, the, the methane um, 
from the anaerobic digestion. So we're still getting this uh, program optimized, but we're seeing some um, the positive results. What I can say is that the the addition of the bioslurry, granted it's not that much yet, it's still a relatively low amount, has not disrupted the activity in the eggs in any way that is problematic for the wastewater treatment plant. So the first things first is do no harm. So we know we're doing no harm, and now we're trying to increase the loads that are being um, provided there so that we can see how it impacts the energy generation. And our hope is that um, this is actually a viable outlet for some of our food scraps uh, because we're leveraging existing infrastructure, siting and permitting is very difficult, um, and that we're able to um, generate uh, energy that can then be um, you know, eventually beneficially um, used by New Yorkers. <clears throat> uh, this is an example, too, of, uh, in Connecticut, a brand new uh, co-located bio um, anaerobic digestion and composting facility called Quantum Biopower. Um, they are just about 100 miles from New York City, and they have started to accept uh, New York City uh, loads of organic material. And what's nice about Quantum Biopower is that they are able to handle uh, the commingled food and yard waste within their system. The, the yard waste um, is problematic at the Newtown Creek wastewater treatment plant. And so they're, there they're having to do an initial separation of you know, food waste from the woody debris. And um, the woody debris is then taken and composted at a separate facility. So this is all a learning curve and, and we're, we're learning how to optimize um, as we have these experiences. Staten Island, um, this is the facility, as I said, that sanitation, um, runs and so we have this is just a couple of pictures so we are um, actually expanding our permit and expanding um, the capacity of uh, this compost facility and we will be using a um, I'm sorry some of this uh, language is a little bit out of date uh, but we will be using um, the gore system to cover our, our windrows and then we also have these covered areas where we tip the material and um, and uh, run it through the tiger equipment so both recycling and organics um, is not just generated on the residential side. We have our institutions. And so we're trying to work on how do we, um, uh, how do, do we get best practices um, up and running in schools to separate material? We all know uh, children are the next generation of adults. Getting them young and early, they can shame their parents into participating in our programs better. They can also, um, um, they can also um, make an impact as they grow older, and um, and this is a normalized, uh, you know, program for them. Separating their food scraps becomes normal. Um, we had a similar situation when we started recycling. You know, it took it was a generational shift of recycling just becoming normal. Um, so we have uh, started a zero waste schools program with the Department of Education, um, and we're intensively working with a hundred schools to see how close we can get them to zero waste. Um, and we also, about 40% of um, New York City public schools are uh, currently receiving organic collection. And we're trying to figure out, work through all the kinks with those first 40% of schools before we add the program uh, citywide. We do have uh, competition programs. The picture here is of some kids who won one of our contests. Um, So the last section of our pie, um, I can go through this um, a little bit uh, quickly so we can get into questions. Um, but you know, one of the issues is you know there's this gray area of materials that we just we haven't found an outlet for. Um, you know, there are some you know boutique programs um, for let's say disposable diaper recycling, but nothing that really we can take to scale at this time. And we're watching all of the innovation innovative projects that are happening out there. And so um, on a policy level, um, New York City is, is really looking at the waste stream and saying, okay, what non-recyclable materials are out there that could be replaced with recyclable materials? How do we eliminate these problematic materials from the waste stream? Um, New York City um, did pass a law to ban styrofoam that is, was under litigation. And now we have two competing bills, one to require us to recycle styrofoam and one to, sorry, foam products and uh, one that is um, looking to ban um, foam products. So that is something that is, is one of the 
policy initiatives that that is currently underway. The left hand picture I wanted to show you because this is these are bags wrapped around recycling equipment. Um, and so bags, while we know bags are an important carrier for for consumer be for resident behavior, um, bags are also a problem on the back end in recycling and in composting. So we're trying to figure out like what is what is the optimal op opportunity here um, with bags, reducing the use of bags, you know, are compostable bags, should they be part of the, the story in New York City in terms of helping to um, provide tools for uh, you know, New Yorkers to um, make it easier for them to do organic separation? And then we've got uh, hazardous materials in the waste stream. Um, there are these standard set of you know, household products that really just, even though they're a tiny portion of the waste stream, they pose a disproportionate um, impact to the environment. So e-waste is one, um, you know, medical waste is another. So your sharps, if you're diabetic, your, your uh, medication that you aren't using. Um, and then you've got your solvents, your, your adhesives, your flammables, um, your paints, all of these products. And so we have, we've developed a robust system in New York City, um, our safe disposal program, where we have permanently sited special waste drop-off sites. And we do um, 10, huge scale, large scale um, collection events or pick up or drop up events every year. Um, and we're trying to expand that program right now so we can capture more of this material. There's a lot of paint out there, let me tell you. Uh, and then we're also looking at, okay, so how do we leverage the, the economies of scale that you can get from such a densely packed city? So two programs that have were launched within the last five years are our e-cycle program and our refashion program. And these are both programs um, targeted to apartment buildings. And the idea here is that we, we install, we work with partners, um, we, ERI is our e-waste vendor, and Housing Works is a nonprofit uh, charitable organization that works with us on refashion. And we, we place cages in apartment buildings where people can drop off their e-waste for recycling or donate their textiles for charitable use, and they, you can actually get your tax credit. So. Um, these are ways to um, consolidate material um, locally within a building and have more economies of scale when then we send trucks around to pick it up. So you, it's a free program. You install these in your building. When your cage is full, you call for a pickup and, and, and our partners um, do the collection. We also are working on how do we actually find, identify the items in the waste stream that could be reused, the durable goods. So we've got the food waste that we want to donate and reuse, but also the durable goods. So we have a Donate NYC program that we launched last year. There's an online directory, um, sort of like uh, Yelp for donating goods, where you plug in your, your, um, your address or your zip code, and you can find out the nearest places to donate items. Um, we also have um, an exchange where businesses and nonprofit organizations can actually um, communicate and say, hey, I have you know, 10 desks that I wanna get rid of and a, a nonprofit says I need 10 desks and they can make a connection. So we're trying to find ways to help make those connections, help to coordinate the reuse of goods before it even makes it into the trash. And we have about 35 um, nonprofit organizations that we work with and we help to uh, support them to to build out their infrastructure, to build out their um, capacity to take in more goods. Because for them, taking in goods is, they're not in the business of waste management, they don't see that. They're in the business of using, you know, selling those reused goods to then uh, perform their charitable mission. And so we're trying to help them gain more resources to perform their charitable work. Um, and at the same time, divert material for us, divert, um, you know, waste, what could have been waste materials, um, you know, on behalf of sanitation. Um, larger picture, um, there are other things that we need to think about when trying to maximize the diversion of materials. Thinking about human nature, thinking about incentiv incentivization. Um, in New York City, waste is, waste is embedded in your taxes. So you are not charged a utility bill for your waste. Um, it is part of the expectation of New Yorkers that your waste is going to get collected for quote unquote free um, every week, every day, um, no matter what. That of course is unlike all of your other utilities, electricity, gas, and water. They're metered, there are expenses. Um, so pay as you throw or save as you throw systems are um, successful in other cities 
to incentivize, to use a financial incentive to get people to um, put more, divert more material and throw away less trash. If you, um, if you price it right and your recycling is, is discounted or free and you pay for the amount of trash that you have, you're gonna be incentivized to minimize that trash bag as much as you can. So what we're doing now is we actually have contracted with uh, consultants to help us think through what could a Save as You Throw system look like in New York City, given all of the diversity of housing stock, homeowners, uh, renters, rent controlled tenants, um, big buildings, single family homes, how could we even think about conceiving of a system in which we would um, turn the waste essentially into a utility bill? Um, so we're just starting that process. We just um, identified our vendor. And so over the next year, we, we're pl we plan to study that to see you know, what, what might be possible in that area. And then I didn't really talk much about the commercial waste side. I wanted to um, focus on the residential. But on the commercial side, as I mentioned before, uh, sanitation does not collect commercial waste. We do regulate the businesses um, and waste is managed by uh, um, a, the private hauling industry. So we have um, many, many private haulers who operate in the city and, um, and it's a free market system. So they can, they can scare up uh, customers wherever they would like. Um, so what we've learned, we did a study this past year, but we've learned, you know, we sort of tried to document the inefficiencies of the uh, private hauling industry as it currently stands. And there are, you know, I would say every individual company operates at its maximum efficiency um, for its route, but the routes aren't always the most efficient depending on where you identify your customers. And so what we've learned by looking at um, routing information from various private carters is that you know, the routes tend to be very long. So on the left-hand picture, that's a picture of one route for a private hauler. It goes through um, three boroughs, um, and it's a very, very long route to collect from individual businesses. Um, the right-hand side is a schematic to show, to illustrate the level of overlap between Carter routes um, throughout the city. So there's, there's a lot of overlap and duplication, and um, the consultants that we worked with identified that we could, ident we could have um, incredible reductions in truck traffic, um, truck miles traveled, and um, air pollutant emissions if we were to find a way to more efficiently um, route and collect um, commercial waste. Um, so this is a, so right now um, what we're doing is we're looking into um, how we would, how we could pursue a geographic zone system for commercial waste management. Um, this is a picture that shows the impact of a zoned system, a theoretical zoned system in the city, and you have 68% reduction in commercial collection truck traffic, 64% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, three and a half million gallon reduction in annual diesel fuel consumption, that goes to your resiliency. Um, and also, um, in theory, you're gonna have cleaner streets and quieter nights if you have fewer trucks passing by your door every night. I was out there, I remember being on a three block radius and I saw 20 different companies collecting in that area, are driving through or collecting, whether or not they stopped, they were driving through or collecting. So it's, it's something that we think um, will have a big impact on sustainability in the city, uh, resiliency. And we just wanna do it carefully and pragmatically. Both State Business Zero and the commercial zoning uh, projects will involve extensive stakeholder engagement um, to do it right. So um, that with that, I will leave it. And I will, um, on behalf of uh, Commissioner Catherine Garcia, I would love to take your questions um, and go into depth more about any of these topics. All right, thank you, Bridget. We do have a number of uh, questions. Um, let's see here. So how do you manage your overall waste data? Is there a particular piece of software that you use? Oh, so <laughs> it's, it's pretty incredible. We actually have a, um, a customized uh, data management system. We have a very, very old mainframe system that we are now shifting over into what we call our smart system. Um, and we, we track um, you know, trucks, where they are in their routes, trucks that are down, 
trucks that are having issues, we track um, every time for every shift that a sanitation truck collects, they, they go over a scale and are weighed. And so by material type, and so for every truck shift, we have weights for every material type in every truck that we manage. Um, but we don't, it's a, it's a customized software system that we use. But it gives us copious amounts of information about the residential um, waste. Great, thanks. Uh, next question is, how do, how do you increase composting facilities or transport out of New York City? And how will New York City regulate and or encourage composting from commercial facilities like office buildings? I know that you talk mostly about on the residential side. Is there anything different you'd like to mention about handling um, composting in commercial facilities? Absolutely, absolutely. And I should have, maybe before you post this, I'll add in one more slide about our commercial organics law. So we uh, passed a law requiring large scale commercial generators of organic waste to source separate their organics. And the law, the law was set up that we had to assess regional capacity to actually take and handle the organic material. And if we thought there was sufficient capacity, we would then require certain establishments to be covered by the law. And so we've done our first designation of establishments and so the biggest, the biggest food generators that we understand are in the city. It's, it covers approximately 300 businesses and it's um, your large stadiums like Yankee Stadium, Madison Square Gardens, Barclays Center, et cetera, um, um, Met Stadium, City Field. Um, it's your large uh, food manufacturers. Um, it is your large hotel, so food service establishments and hotels of 150 or more rooms. Um, and so your food wholesalers, who, food, sorry, food, large food wholesalers, uh, distributors, um, ho food service in a ho large hotels and stadiums. And um, we are in the process now of determining whether or not there's regional capacity to expand the number of covered establishments. So the idea is that we're going to work our way from the largest food generators down to the smaller ones. Um, office buildings are not yet required. However, what we're finding is that the private haulers who are deciding to get into the business of collecting and hauling food waste now that they're in the business and they're sending trucks around, they're actively recruiting businesses that aren't even necessarily required by law yet to do it. So um, arrangements, it, it is worthwhile if there are buildings that are interested in looking into this for sustainability reasons, even if they're not required, to talk to their hauler and, and find out whether or not they provide the service. Great, um, let's see here. So do you think switching from the current dual stream recycling to single stream would significantly increase contamination that you might have to deal with? So we, I mean, we know from other cities' experiences that um, contamination can go up, uh, but we have a fairly inclusive program at this time. And um, so we, we anticipate that there may be, there may be a, an increase in contamination, but we don't anticipate it's going to be that significant to the point where it's going to, uh, you know, be problematic for our vendors. Okay. Does the Department of Sanitation offer enforcement for excessive organics or recycling contamination or for buildings that don't offer recycling? Yes. Yeah, so on the, so organics at this time on the residential side, there are no violations issued for the organics program. We're trying to be very inclusive and positive and, and um, roll out the program on a voluntary basis first, make sure people understand how to do it. And then you know there may be a path towards making it mandatory, but we're not there yet. On the recycling side and commercial businesses, the ones that are covered by the law are getting enforced against. We are actually um, actively um, sending inspectors to those buildings to make sure that um, those businesses are uh, complying with the law. On the recycling side, uh, it's been the law and there have been tickets issued since 1989. Um, on the commercial side, we just updated our commercial recycling rules uh, to mirror the residential rules. So now if you're at home or if you're at work, you would have to recycle the same items. Um, and the enforcement for that, those new rules goes into effect in August. So we do intend to issue violations. Okay. Um, can you explain the bin washing procedures for your organic bins? 
Bin washing, so this is another interesting thing about you got to work within the confines of where you are. So uh, originally when we did the pilot on Staten Island, we were encouraging people not to line their bins to um, place their organic material loose in the bins or maybe in paper bags. And, you know, that means that you're going to have to uh, rinse out your bins on a regular basis. And in Staten Island, where you might have a yard and a hose, that is imminently possible. Um, as we started to roll out the program into denser areas of the city where that sort of opportunity, the washing out your bin is not really an option either by space or lack of access to the water, um, they quickly realized that we, um, we had to allow people to line their bins. So while we prefer people to line their bins with compostable bags or um, paper bags, we do allow clear plastic liners in the program. And we have the equipment installed at this point that will debag, that'll open up those bags so that we can get to the organic material at the transfer stations. Uh, so so washing, you know, we don't have a particular standard. We do recommend that people regularly wash out and maintain their bins for all of their material streams. Okay, that certainly makes sense given the population densities, the, the variety of them you have in, in the five boroughs. So, yeah. um, so for the organics drop-off locations, are those staffed by someone who can keep contaminants out? How clean is the material that's collected at those sites? <laughs> the green, the, the drop-off material is the best, cleanest, most pristine, most desirable material that we collect. Um, we, our, our vendors are always vying to get that material because it's the cleanest and it's not yard waste, it's just food. Um, most of our sites are staffed. Um, that is, however, you know, a big resource uh, burden. And so we are looking into experimenting with unstaffed drop-offs. Um, what we've done to date in just our little experiments is we've taken drop-off sites that have been staffed in the past and um, experimented with not having people there all the time um, and having someone sort of check in and monitor the bins but not be there standing at the bin all the time. Um, We've seen um, the contamination rate hasn't really gone up significantly in those situations. The people who have gone there have gone there for a long time. They've been well trained by our by our partners that that sort of staff those drop off sites. Um, we are cautiously looking into how could we, if we want to dramatically increase the opportunities to drop off your food scraps, say in Manhattan, you know, we can't really afford to staff every bin, and so. The question becomes then, how do you do with essentially a public space drop-off program and, and minimize contamination? And there are other cities that have experimented with uh, key codes or keys or other ways to restrict access to the bins unless you've signed up and committed to you know, providing only the good material. So we're considering experimenting with that, but if anyone has good ideas, I would love to hear them because a limitation for us to expand the drop-off program is the staffing issue. But we do we don't want to have what happened with uh, public space recycling, which is, you know, most of our unfortunately most of our recycling bins out there on the streets. You look inside, and the material is indistinguishable from the litter basket. Hmm. So, okay. Um, when I okay, uh, this may be from someone who lives in the city. Uh, when I reviewed the community compost guidelines last week, it said only vegetable food scraps were collected, no bones, et cetera, no yard waste which is different from the outside collection, or excuse me, the curbside collection. How are you explaining this to residents to avoid confusion with the limited but future expansion of the curbside program, which will then accept more materials? So I guess maybe um, maybe that speaks to how, how, how do the consumers know what they're supposed to put how the, what they're supposed to put where and and how you how you manage that when you're rolling things out with pilots and phases and that sort of thing. Right, right. So we, we actually, I mean, we basically do that distinction. We say drop off program, this stuff, curbside program, that stuff. And we even will, there are people who are very committed to their green markets and their green market programs who um, still want to drop off at the green market. And so we say, well, bring the green market, your vegetable scraps and give us everything else. Um, the green markets um, are, because they're staffed, we, ha we are very good at educating people who are going to those locations. On our website, we have a Google map that identifies all the locations. And at each location, it, it will give you the hours 
and what materials are accepted. And while in theory, there are certain locations, um, there are certain local uh, composting uh, sites that could potentially handle a broader um, array of materials. For consistency, we, we advertise a very specific set of materials for the drop-off program and a very specific set of materials for the curbside program. Okay. And so we, we've seen maybe a little bit of confusion, but for the most part, people seem to understand the difference. And, and, and where materials are, where the drop-offs are staffed, we have people right there to answer those questions. Okay. And you, you had uh, mentioned uh, that, that uh, you had information available on your website. So that, I guess that's a broader question. You, you had mentioned the One New York program and some other um, New York City document, uh, zero waste documents that you're using as part of your program. Are those available yep. on, on your website so that uh, the, the viewers can reference those? Yes, absolutely. So if nyc.gov slash DSNY is our website. And um, so all of we have maps of all of our uh, drop off areas of all of our curbside areas. We also have all of our reports. So if you're interested in diving deeper into our waste characterization study, we have all of our, our report and all of our data up on the website. We also have our uh, report that we wrote about our findings from the first two years of piloting the organic collection program, the 2015 report. We have a report about the community composting uh, uh, work. There's over 225 community composting sites that we surveyed to find out, um, you know, what they're doing, what their practices are, um, you know, what they see needing to change and, and improve for their own uh, program. So we have a lot of material, information, reports, statistics, if there are people who want, are interested in tonnage statistics, we have all of our diversion uh, information on there that we update monthly on the website as well. Okay. And the fact that you are dealing with um, uh, plastics in the uh, organic stream, um, is, is that, are the ag plastics or the bio, bioplastics being um, captured in any way? The, uh, you mean the compostable plastics? Or? Yeah, the non-compostable the non plastics. Yeah, so so what's happening is um, we're collecting our material and uh, delivering it to the transfer station. At the transfer station, we are running it through this mechanical equipment and debagging, de essentially, the material. So we are doing an initial upfront pre-processing of the materials so that what gets sent to the ultimate composting facility um, has minimal amount of contamination. These, this equipment is not perfect, so there is some material that still gets through, but we get it to a level that's acceptable by, you know, a, a facility. And we're working through that. So we, we run test loads. You know, we have a new, we have a brand new stretch station that just, just installed their equipment. We're sending test loads to different facilities saying, is this clean enough for you? What do we need to do differently? So we're kind of learning as we, going, as we go to figure out how much of that debagging has to happen at the transfer station before we deliver it. Okay. And uh, will organics collected from schools be delivered to and composted at the new phase two contract sites? Yes, yeah, so the, the organics collected from schools is uh, is processed the same way the residential material is. Goes to the same transfer stations, goes to the same end facilities. Schools are, schools are a challenge. You know, while, you know, we, what we say is it's not a kid problem, it's an adult problem <laughs> with schools. There are so many different players in a school to make the system operate um, and function, and all those different players have to be in alignment and have to be working together to successfully manage um, a high diversion um, a high diversion program. It's it's so much easier if you if you're the night staff just to throw everything in the same bin and set it out of the curb. So you know, getting that buy-in and getting the commitment of the schools to really properly separate materials is a challenge. So we do deal with contamination issues in schools. Schools are the biggest challenge. Early days, um, New York City used to use foam trays for lunch, and um, foam was a huge problem uh, for the facilities as a big major contaminant. And so we did successfully um, switch to compostable plates from foam trays. Um, we thought we had solved our problem and move on, but what we learned is that the compostable plates, while they are compostable, at scale, you have 1.1 million students in the New York City school system eating lunch every day. 
a lot of plates um, also creates a problem for the composters. It's too much, uh, too much of that material. While in theory it breaks down, it's just too much. And so we're trying to now figure out, do we do shredding of that material before it gets sent for composting? Are there other ways that we can sort of, do we wet down the plates so that they start to break down? So we're trying to figure out, you know, how to best manage school waste. But it is a challenge. We get a lot of chip bags. We get a lot of uh, contamination in those cafeteria loads. Okay. And um, just an administrative note, we are getting close to 245, um, although I do have a number of uh, really good questions left. So for those of you who have to move on to other meetings, thank you for listening to us. It, um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And um, Bridget, there are a number of questions here that are um, New York City centric and are just going to be quick answers. So I'll whip through those, but there are another uh, a number of other good, more general questions that perhaps um, you know everyone may get some benefit of. So, um, how does the compost get to the Newtown Creek plant by barge? No, so the um, in this three-year test program, the uh, it's by tanker trucks. So. The transfer station that is actually turning the food waste into a bioslurry is uh, located very close, it's like not very far from the Newtown Creek wastewater treatment plant. So once it's a bioslurry, it get, then gets actually put on a tanker truck and delivered to the um, facility and then pumped into the system. Okay. And uh, what percent of resident organics collected is going to Fresh Kills, McEnroe, or, or co-digestion? Do you have any sort of uh, approximate breakdown of that? I uh, I don't off the top of my head. I'm happy to share information about that with um, with the audience. I, maybe I can share with you some information that you could disseminate. Okay. Um, the, the Staten Island facility only manages Staten Island material, so that's one thing I can tell you that we've um, there's enough material on Staten Island alone for us to um, to use that facility for Staten Island material. Um, and then we have multiple, you know, the regional facilities. We have multiple vendors depending. Um, and, and and like I said, Quantum Biopar is brand new, so that's a new vendor that opened up for us. But I can I'm happy to share more information on that to disseminate. Okay. And um, let's see. So for recycling a multifamily over commercial, is there any been any consideration of requiring commercial property owners to provide recycling to the residents, or is that more of the residents' responsibility? It's you know our the way our laws work. Um, we are not allowed to mix commercial and residential waste streams um, because commercial waste is the purview of the private hauler and residential waste is the purview of um, sanitation. There are some minor exceptions to that, but it's um, with the current the current sort of legal man landscape, it's it's difficult to to combine the two. Okay. Interesting um, idea, though. Is um, is the city council con uh, considering any sort of plastic bag ban at this point? So uh, the city passed a fee, a five cent fee on uh, plastic bags that um, the state decided to um, to overturn and to delay and study whether or not there should be a statewide uh, policy around plastic bags. Because it, within New York State, there are several um, townships and cities that have looked into or passed plastic bag fees. And um, some of them have been successful and operational, but I think uh, once New York and other, you know, city, more cities started to get involved, the state decided they wanted to take a, a statewide approach. So we're we're sort of in a holding pattern, waiting to see whether or not they will allow us to get, to move forward with a fee. Okay, and uh, we have a stray uh, electronics question snuck in the organic stream here. So. Is electronics recycling free for use in the ERI electronics containers that are in residential buildings? Yeah, both of the e-cycle and refashion uh, programs are free are free for apartment buildings. So it's a free service that we provide. Okay. Um, let's see here. Can you, can your plan for organic waste collection and processing deal with Compostable food service packaging like PLA, which replaces plastic in bags that that will replace extended foam packaging. So we are we are not decided yet in the long about the long term uh, about long term whether or not 
you know, what role compostable packaging is going to have. We think with compostable bags, they may be a key component to a successful program just because of the human behavior of wanting to bag the material. Um, but as far as the sort of the, t the food packaging, um, we're, the jury is out. We're still, we're looking at it, we're setting it. We actually are doing some testing of different products um, at our facility and we're looking at the testing results in other facilities to understand what the options, what the, what the best uh, path forward is. We, you know, it's interesting, Seattle very successfully um, incorporates compostable um, packaging in their program. However, um, Portland uh, had, had some problems with it. And so we wanna take a kind of a cautious approach to determine you know, what role compostable packaging is going to play. Okay. Uh, how many outreach and education staff do you have? We have, um, so full-time full -time outreach staff. Um, well, let's put it this way. My Bureau of Recycling and Sustainability is a staff of 50 people. That includes outreach, that also includes analysts, that also includes um, public education, you know, folks who are doing graphic design and correspondence, um, contract management. Um, but on top of that, we leverage several non-governmental um, opportunities. So we use New York City Service Corps, which is an AmeriCorps program. Um, and we have, I think, 25 AmeriCorps volunteers. We have uh, summer interns every summer. And we also partner with nonprofit organizations. So we partner with Grown YC, which is a nonprofit organization in New York City, and they have um, a staff of, I believe, around um, 10 to 12 who also, their whole sole purpose is to do outreach and education around our programs. And um, we also uh, leverage uh, outreach and education through our partners in the compost project. So we have the botanical gardens in the city and other nonprofits that help us do education and outreach. So our full-time staff, this is way too much detail, our full-time staff and my bureau is 50, but we leverage and fund other nonprofit partners as well. Okay. And um, do, do you find that, that uh, plastic bags are, are causing your MRFs uh, lots of problems, or do you have a, a market for those, those plastic bags in and of themselves? We do not um, have, right now, to my knowledge, we do not successfully market the bags that are separated out at our materials recovery facility for any um, as a commodity. Okay. Um, so, okay. and, and it is, and, and the bags are a problem in terms of having to um, take time to clear out the equipment when it gets gunged up on a regular basis every shift. Yeah, that was, that was a, a very effective slide that you had on the left-hand side of that one page. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, did, does New York City have uh, a lot of problems with illegal dumping? Um, how, do, how do you handle illegal dumping with your zero waste plan? Uh, we, we do, we have historically had challenges with legal dumping um, and that has not gone away and we anticipate that to continue, um, unfortunately. Uh, so we, like I said, we, as uh, sanitation, we have collections staff, we have cleaning, uh, cleaning oper collection operation, cleaning operation and snow operation. And the cleaning operation also includes uh, illegal dumping uh, management. So we are dispatched to sites where there's illegal dumping prob problems. We know where there are chronic issues that we monitor. Um, it's a chronic challenge that um, is not necessarily going to go away, um, but we do monitor and manage it. Okay, um, let's see here. Uh, so, so follow up on the question regarding the potential increase of the contamination going to single stream. Is, is there any thought to about the, the uh, commodities losing value as a part of the as a byproduct of that switch? Yeah. So this is <laughs> excuse <coughs> excuse me. This is part of the considerations that we've made. You know, when considering um, the switch to single stream. And luckily, um, we have, you know, very sophisticated facilities um, to handle the material. And um, we plan to, um, you know, install infrastructure needed to maximize the value of, of the sorting of the material. Um, we know that there's challenges, but we, we think that it's ultimately we are going to be better off by moving to single stream than not for, on, as a, on a holistic basis for the entire zero waste program. 
Okay. Um, let's see here. So have you talked to Pratt Industries about how they view single stream recycling? Have you done any coordination with them? Yep, yep. We've been speaking with all of our um with all of our partners, all of our vendors. Okay. Um, are you using any sort of technology specifically like RFID chips in in using uh, to, to monitor resident participation or anything like that? We we in, so all of our brown bins have RFID tags, um, and when we rolled out the pilot program for the first two years, we did actually install RFID readers on our trucks. We found that for our purposes, the RFID readers um, did not work that well um, to provide ongoing data. So they function, they would read the RFID tags. However, we have a manual collection uh, program. And so, and the standard practice um, by our sanitation workers is you know, to, to collect the bags and, and put them in the truck. So to bring the, um, the bin to the back of the truck to dump it in, um, if, if, if the material in the bin was in a bag, they would take the bag and not the bin, and so then the bin wouldn't read. So we found that our, our because of the sort of standard practices of our collections, um, the RFID um, readers weren't, weren't always accurate. So we did some comparisons between doing sort of visual monitoring of the number of bins being set out versus what the RFID data is telling us. And it, it really, um, it wasn't as it wasn't accurate enough to make it a worthwhile thing to continue doing. That being said, when when you have semi-automated trucks and you know that the um, the bin's going to be in the appropriate location to be read at every time, I think it can be an incredibly useful tool. Okay, well, we're down to the last few here. I know you need to. You've been talking with your cold, so we need to get something to drink here pretty soon. Um, have you looked into rinsing carts rather than using plastic bags in the uh, food and organic waste um, collections composting process? Like, was there, like, what sort of analysis did you perform to decide, you know, that perhaps the bags was the better way to go? For, um, you mean to, to allow people to line their bins with bags? Yes. Is that what you mean? Or, mm -hmm. I, I think it, it was really a practical matter. Um, you know, it not in, in, when you're in the denser, medium and higher denser parts, dense parts of the city, there literally are no opportunities to be able to wash out your bin. Um, and for us, a, a, bin, a bin cleaning service was something that would be cost prohibitive for us to provide to, you know, a city of eight and a half million people. Right, right. Um, okay. Um, the, the tiger debagger you mentioned, do you have any idea what that costs? The tiger, mm -hmm. you said, or? Yes. Uh, I again, I, the tiger, the turbo separator, the different uh, equipment, I, I can send information about that. Um, I'm okay. happy to provide that information offline. Okay. Is uh, is is your uh, departmental data, is that available through the New York City Open Data Portal? Yes. Yep. We participate in the New York City Open Data Program. Okay. And uh, have you have you considered using Dirty MRFs at all for processing your waste material? We have in the past uh, sent loads to um, to different types of facilities, including mixed waste uh, processing. And um, so we have experimented with that, but we've found that the, the outcomes, the, the beneficial um, commodities coming out, um, you know, were, did not, were, not, were not that good. But it doesn't mean that technologies and innovations can't be improved. And, you know, we're, not, we're, we're agnostic as to uh, what opportunities might be out there as long as they are effective at creating the beneficial commodities that we need to to ensure that we're beneficially using the material. Um, okay. right, right now, we, we've we've committed to a source separation program. Okay. Um, are you abandoning public place recycling or trying some new efforts along those lines? Does the transit system have any separate recycling or composting uh, efforts? So the MTA has, um, they have a one bin system, so there's no source separation within the subways. They did a waste audit several years ago that determined that most of the material was, uh, you know, newspapers and um, bottles and containers. So they anticipated that, that mo they'd be able to, um, through post-collection separation, they'd be able to actually recover a large portion of their material. Um, for us, the public space recycling program is, is really, 
it's so important from an educational perspective to co-locate and provide opportunities for, for New Yorkers to be able to recycle at home, at work, at play, in transit. Um, it's, it just has not been, unfortunately, um, the, the bins aren't always properly used. And so we are committed to keeping the program and we actually have successful bins in some places. It's not a disaster um, everywhere. Um, where we have partners, we have partners who will adopt a bin and may monitor the bin and maintain the bin. Business improvement districts are very effective at helping us to um, to use public space recycling bins. So it's really, um, it's not a perfect system. It's a system we, we don't plan to abandon, but it also um, isn't something we plan to expand without a plan. Okay. All right, last, uh, last two questions. Is the zero waste separation model for schools regulated, meaning the colors and what should be placed in each container? Yes, we have a standard um, zero waste sorting station setup that every school uses. And um, all of the you know, signage and materials, everything is, is color coded, st standard uh, pictures, you know, images on the bins, um, all of the, everything is standardized, yes. Okay, and then I promise you the very last question is, can you repeat the, um, the New York City Resources website that you referred to earlier for the, um, to get all of the New York City sustainability documents? Absolutely, so our, the, our, the sanitation website is nyc.gov slash DSNY, so Department of Sanitation New York. Um, and then if you wanna get a shortcut directly to the organics area, you can do nyc.gov slash organics. Um, and that just takes you directly to the portion of the website that's specifically organics. Um, and then within the website, you, you can navigate to the area with reports and statistics that will give you um, all of our reports. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Bridget. And uh, I did get some comments from a, a number of listeners who really enjoyed the presentation. And so we want to give you... Um, I'll give you our thanks there. And um, so I guess that's it. And um, again, this webinar, like all the webinars in the series, has been recorded and we will put it on, on YouTube at both the uh, National Recycling Coalition and Recycling Market Center websites. Thanks again for joining us and we hope you'll join next month's webinar. Please visit the NRC and RMC websites for schedule updates.